Even in Star Trek, you don't get to the top without getting your hands dirty, and Captain Jean-Luc Picard is no angelic exception. From lying and cheating to breaking hearts and maybe just straight up killing his best friend, here's the worst stuff that Star Trek's Captain Picard has ever done. Let's go ahead and start with what is arguably the single worst thing Jean-Luc Picard has ever done. Early in the series, Picard is presented with an opportunity to do good on a truly cosmic scale, which could have saved countless lives and changed the entire series. But no, he lets his temper get the best of him and throws it all in the trash, dooming a huge portion of the galaxy in the process. We're talking, of course, about his rejection of Q's offer to join the crew of the Enterprise in Season 2's Q Who. My purpose is to join you. To join us as what? As a member of the crew, willing and able, ready to serve. In case you've forgotten, calling Q godlike would actually be an understatement. Time, space, and reality itself are all subject to his every whim. And yet, when he asks Picard for permission to join the crew, Picard gives it about 14 seconds worth of thought before rejecting him outright. This happens despite the fact that he even admits that letting Q join up would actually be in keeping with what he's supposed to be doing on his continuing mission. To quote the man himself, Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it sits. He gives that stirring speech only seven episodes before this one. What a difference two months make. But no, Q and all his infinite power are rejected from the Federation by one grumpy captain because of the gut feeling of, I don't trust you. Speak for yourself, Jean-Luc. You're the guy who rejected the reality-warping cosmic deity, but let Wesley Crusher fly the flagship of the Federation during a red alert because he was slightly better at it than the average teenager. If there's anyone Picard shouldn't trust, it should probably be him. The worst part about Picard's rejection of Q's request to join the Federation isn't the lost potential of what Q might have done if he had been allowed to serve. It's what Q actually did to prove Picard wrong. After the captain's smarmy rejection, Q decides to prove that Picard needs him, so he chucks the Enterprise into the far-off Delta Quadrant and introduces the crew to the Borg. This, as you may already know, does not work out well for the Federation in general, or for Picard in particular, and gives the Next Generation era its most devastating antagonist. Admittedly, you can't blame this one entirely, or even mostly, on Picard. First contact with the Borg and all the genocidal suffering that follows from it as they turn their attention to the Federation and start creeping towards the Alpha Quadrant is definitely the result of Q's actions, even if it never seems to come up in the rest of Picard and Q's playfully antagonistic relationship. Still, if Picard hadn't provoked him, if he had admitted from the start that he might not be completely prepared for exploring the unknown depths of space and all its hidden dangers, instead of getting all smug and arrogant about it, not smugness, not arrogance. But we're resolute, we're determined, and your help is not required." Then perhaps Q wouldn't have felt the need to prove how woefully incorrect he was. So yeah, that part is all Q. You know what was definitely Picard's choice, though? Hanging out in System J-25 and poking around to see what nightmarish hive mind monsters he could find instead of turning around immediately, despite Guinan warning him that this was an extremely bad idea. Sure, it would have taken them two years at maximum warp to get to the nearest starbase, but given that the alternative was homicidal time-traveling cybercubes, it probably would have been worth the trip. Given that he's the one who led the Borg to the Federation to begin with, it's actually somewhat fitting that Captain Picard was the figurehead of one of their most devastating attacks. In the fan-favorite two-part finale and premiere, respectively, of seasons three and four, the best of both worlds, Picard is abducted from the bridge of the Enterprise by the Borg and assimilated into the Collective, re-emerging as a mechanical nightmare called Locutus. As his name implies, it's Latin for he who has spoken, Locutus was meant to serve as a sort of spokesman, the single face of the larger Collective, giving the Borg's more individualistic prey a single leader that they would, in theory, be more likely to relate to and obey. The trick, of course, is that while he appeared to be the one demanding surrender and giving the order for the attack that killed Benjamin Sisko's wife, Locutus was still controlled entirely by the Collective. I will continue aboard this ship to speak for the Borg. While they continue, without further diversion, as a result, this is another one that seems like it's not really Picard's fault. He quite literally was not in control at the time. The horror of the story is that he was an unwilling passenger who was forced to watch while his own body did all these horrible things. Really, he's the victim here, not the perpetrator. Although there are a couple of things that are at least a little more on him. First is the fact that Locutus and his attack on the Federation are broadcast across the galaxy, meaning that pretty much everyone alive saw him do it. 
Secondly, if you just got rescued from being the not-so-friendly spokesman for galactic genocide, maybe take some time and let things cool off. Picard takes all of one episode to go to France for a fistfight with his brother, and even then, he initially refuses to acknowledge the horrific trauma that he's been through. Captain Picard's romance with Beverly Crusher is one of Star Trek's most underrated relationships. Sure, Riker and Troy might have had the long history and on-again, off-again drama, and O'Brien and Keiko have the sugar-sweet romance and relatively happy marriage nailed down. But Picard and Crusher have that long, simmering slow burn that gets its hooks into viewers. It starts in Episode 2 and is even a crucial plot point in the series finale. The road to get there, however, was a pretty rough one, particularly because Picard, well, kind of sort of got Beverly's husband killed. Back before he took command of the Enterprise, Picard was the captain of the USS Stargazer and Lieutenant Commander Jack Crusher, Beverly's husband, was both a member of his crew and his best friend. Unfortunately, Picard was in love with Beverly, but he kept a lid on his feelings. Maybe. See, Jack was killed while serving on the Stargazer, and his death is usually referred to as an accident. But in Season 1's Coming of Age, it's revealed that Jack's fate involved Captain Picard having to make some kind of choice about who lived and who died. How odd, then, that he chose to kill off his alleged best pal, leaving Beverly a tragic widow. Surely the fact that the woman he'd been silently in love with for years would suddenly be conveniently single couldn't possibly have had anything to do with it. You may be willing to forgive Picard's bad temper, but there's one flaw that's undeniably, objectively a part of his personality. That dude is a damn dirty cheater. Or at least he was back in the day. In Tapestry, the episode where Q famously allows Picard to relive his younger days to avoid an early death, we get a very different picture of Picard than we might expect. He was a cocky, brash, troublemaking ladies' man who broke hearts and rules in equal measure. He was such a rule-breaker, in fact, that he and his friend Corey once cheated their way right into getting stabbed. It happened after they were hustled at the game of Donjot, which is basically billiards but with even more math. They rigged the table, which isn't exactly the behavior you'd expect from a guy who once said this. The first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth." Needless to say, it didn't work out as planned. While Picard was only an accessory to the table rigging, he was all in for the bar fight and wound up taking a dagger to the heart. What's really interesting, however, is that if he hadn't done the cheating and gotten stabbed, he would have wound up in the Starfleet equivalent of a dead-end job, with zero heroics to his name. Being a dirty, lying cheat is an intrinsic part of who he is as a person. Starfleet's primary mission, stated at the top of every single episode of both the original series and The Next Generation, is to seek out new life and new civilizations. Presumably, there's also something in there about what you should do when you find them, and it's hard to believe that immediately kill them with laser beams is part of it. Someone probably should have told Captain Picard that before Galaxy's Child from Season 4, where that's exactly what happens when the Enterprise encounters a strange new spacefaring creature. The creature attempts to defend itself from what it probably saw as a gigantic metal predator, so Picard gives the order to fire on it and is then very surprised that it dies. Sure, he uses the lowest setting, but these aren't the little dustbusters that the crew carries around. These are the ship's phasers. Even at minimum power, these are phasers they use to fight other spaceships. What exactly did he expect? The worst part? It turns out that the life form had a baby and that it was attacking the Enterprise to defend its child. Basically, Captain Picard killed Space Bambi's mom. Even by the standards of Star Trek episodes about reality-bending time loops, Time Squared is a weird one. It starts when the Enterprise finds a second Captain Picard, whose vital signs reveal that he's from six hours into the future. He's delirious and impaired from his trip through time, as well as a mysterious event that destroyed his version of the Enterprise. As the next six hours go by, Picard, too, improves to the point of reenacting what he did before, trying once again to lure a mysterious vortex away from the ship. The thing is, Picard 1 knows that's not going to work and that it could lead to the destruction of the Enterprise and another trip through the time loop, so he has to put a stop to it. He does exactly that by picking up a phaser and shooting his own time-tossed double, killing him right there in the shuttle bay. It all works out in the end. Instead of avoiding the vortex, the Enterprise flies through it. But still, violently killing your double, even for the best possible reason, is… well, if it's not a truly terrible act, it's certainly a weird one. And for Picard, that's saying something. One of the Next Generation's most underused characters was Vash, the shady, vivacious archaeologist who answered the question of what would happen if Han Solo and Indiana Jones got together and raised a daughter who followed in their footsteps. She was a swashbuckling rogue whose relationship with Picard had more than its share of sparks. Sadly, she only has two appearances on TNG, plus a single incredibly depressing follow-up on Deep Space Nine. Even sadder, 
Despite an undeniable affection for her, Captain Picard never tells any of his friends about her after her first appearance. When she shows up again, she's clearly hurt by the fact that Picard seems ashamed of his relationship with her. Then, in one final twist of the knife, Picard ends that second appearance, which mostly involves a romp through the Star Trek version of a Ren Faire, by being so desperate to get rid of her that he hands her off to Q, the same guy he said he didn't trust to do the job he gave to a teenager. Surprise, surprise, it does not go well. That depressing DS9 episode where Vash comes back for one final time turns into an allegory for abusive relationships, with Vash trying to break free of Q and Q responding by straight up torturing her with a plague right there on the promenade. Great job on keeping your friends safe on that one, Jean-Luc. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.